limited from here on and that's crucial. Back to you. Okay, remember yesterday CLSA upgraded uh, the tech uh, stocks mm. as well, Tech Mahindra, TCS and HCL Tech. So yesterday CLSA and today JP mm. Morgan. Right, well back to back, right? The first trades that are coming up on your screen and I think we've got, uh, has to be record highs, right? I mean, uh, the uh, prices will come up on your screen. We are starting at, yeah, new highs. 22,554 is what the start is at, 120 points higher. The previous was 22,530-ish uh, and a few points. But this is uh, a new high, a new record high coming through. Half a percent is what that translates into. The Nifty Bank, by the way, is up 0.8%. Uh, I saw 48,000, yeah, 48,000 uh, around on the Nifty Bank. Mid-cap index is starting strong. I mean, the strongest uh, of uh, the uh, lot. I mean, 0 0.6, 0 0.65%. And I think the small cap index should also be in the uh, green. Lots and lots of stocks to talk about. Sonia has got the rates. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. It's a very good start for the market. Just look at that. The Nifty is now up almost half a percent uh, at the 22,560 mark. And the mid-cap index, as we've been telling you, is sitting at a record high. Uh, let's go straight to individual stocks now. You have HDFC Bank, which is reacting to, uh, you know, their numbers, the business update that has come through. And in pre-opening as well, HDFC Bank was up. Look at that, 2% higher now on HDFC Bank. Angel 1. Uh, the climb base was very strong in quarter four, up 61% year on year and 14% quarter on quarter. So the street is reacting to that. However, the gross client acquisition has slowed down a bit. Avenue Supermarts is the other one. Very strong business updates, standalone revenue growth of almost 20%. Store addition is up almost about 12.5%, so looking very strong there. LNT Finance, strong retail disbursement growth of 33% year on year. LNT Finance is up about 2 odd percent. RBL Bank, the deposit growth is the highest that we've seen in the last 12 quarters. So 3% up move on RBL Bank. Couple of these pipe companies are in focus. Astral is what I'm looking at this morning as Goldman Sachs has initiated coverage with a 2300 target price on Astral. They're very bullish on that space. Then you have Poonawala FinCorp, which has given a very strong quarter four disbursement growth. AU Small Finance Bank, the deposit growth is up 26%, so looking pretty good over there. Look at the stock now up almost 3%. And IEX as well, the total volume growth has been in single digits, up about 6.2%. I also want to just take a quick look at some of the tech stocks that JP Morgan has upgraded. Reema was telling us about an upgrade on persistence systems on LTI, Mindtree as well as on KPIT Tech. So these three stocks could be in focus. Remember yesterday, CLSA upgraded the large cap tech stocks as well. So Nifty IT perhaps could play leadership in the next couple of days. Back to you. Well, thanks a lot for that, uh, Sonia. Well, uh, you know, keep an eye out on Vedanta. That's the stock that I highlighted earlier today. If you want to play metals, there is a promoter risk. There is valuation support though. Vedanta is up close to around 4.5%. It has exposure to aluminium, silver, zinc. Silver, in fact, you know, will be via Hindustan Zinc. So that stock as well is up close to 2%. But the volume is very, very, uh, uh, you know, limited out there owing to the limited free float. So that stock is up 2.5%. SCI Land, now that stock is up close to 10%. I recall the stock being in a 5% band. I'm not sure whether or not that's got flexed. But that could be the reason why that stock, in fact, is up close to 12% as we speak. Big up move is what we're seeing out there. OG1 Small Finance Bank up close to 3.5%. 3 Bank of India as well is piling on the gains in there. That stock, in fact, is up close to around 3.5%. RBL, as Sonia mentioned, well, that stock as well is doing pretty well. But it's a lot about commodities as well because you have a few more stocks. Nalco, on Monday, we highlighted that that could be the stock to watch. The stock was at around 150 rupees. It has the tailwind with regard to aluminium production, alumina production, aluminium prices, and also they're going to get the benefit of getting captive coal. And the stock is, is up close to around 20% in this week itself. It was at around 150, now it's at around 180 odds. So good going on them. Oil India is seeing some pullback. The stock is down 1.5% and India Mart as well. But Prashant, a good looking screen. When your biggest weight in there, that's HDFC Bank, starts off in the green. It's supported by the tech names. Well, it's a recipe for a good day. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we uh, climbed over the 22,600 mark on the Nifty today as well, right? For the first time. Uh, so lots of records, of course, falling along the way. Uh, 145 uh, on the Nifty is what we have. Just uh, the, uh, the one name is uh, just a big move, right? KEC, if you can have that up. It's the second biggest volume-led gainer. I think uh, we highlighted that they've received orders, some 800 crores worth of orders. Uh, and uh, we'll try and have the company uh, join us. But that's a, a large name with an 8% pop. And look at the volumes there uh, coming through uh, as well. Uh, what else? Tata Investment Corp. I mean, some of the usual suspects, right? 5% higher. Irida, by the way, is up 5%. It's got massive volumes. It's actually the number one volume uh, lead gainer right now. Uh, there is Webel Solar, which is up uh, 5%. Uh, 
uh, yeah, some of these names have seen vertical moves over the last couple of years. Webull is one of them. Uh, there is, uh, you know, JP Power, which is up 5% out of the blue, right? I mean, uh, no real, uh, uh, small name uh, now, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's uh, seeing some action. So I'm just trying to spot things with volumes. Uh, Cochin ship, so Mazgao, Cochin, uh, Gardens, uh, Garden Reach, all these shipbuilders saw big 5 7% moves yesterday. They're all coming off a little bit, all three of them. Uh, Mazgao is down one, Cochin is down one and a third, and Garden Reach is down about 1%. Uh, we've got Apollo Hospitals, which is, I mean, but nothing, no a real big price change. India Mart is down about 1%. Aurobindo Pharma is down 1%. Uh, there's something like a Gulf Oil, uh, which is down about three quarters of a percent. All in all, I mean, it's a pretty healthy screen out there. You know, I just want to spend a little bit of time zooming out, right? I mean, we always talk about the here and the now, but today the market is once again at fresh record highs. Yeah. And, you know, my colleague Hormuz very uh, helpfully tells us that from the COVID low of 7,500, the Nifty has already tripled. Mm. So from the 2020 low, the Nifty has already tripled. And hence, you, you know, the popular adage, right? Always buy when the market is fearful. Uh, be greedy when the market is fearful and that would have played out for you very well. By the way, the mid-cap index is also at a fresh record high. So all of those stocks that we had a couple of weeks ago about big, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, capitulation in the mid-cap index, none of that has played out. The market has climbed every wall of worry. Well, March 24th, 2020, that was the day we went down to 7,511. But as they say, if hindsight was foresight, well, everyone would be millionaires, right? <laughs> Well, Dheeraj Agarwal is now joining us. Uh, he's Managing Director, Ambit Investment Managers. Uh, Dheeraj, great to have you with us Hi, here. Good morning. Appreciate it. Uh, so, how are things looking? I mean, should I be asking that question? <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> fine, right? Yeah, how things, will they look is the question uh, from things, here out. Things are looking fine. I think March volatility was a little torrid, as you mentioned on the show a yeah. while ago, that uh, with March, quite a, quite, a, quite a large number of names, which were the best performers going into March last six or eight months, uh, took a bit of a knock, right? So mid caps and PSUs uh, all suddenly fell 15, 20% in a span of seven, eight, nine days and mid caps maybe three or four weeks. Uh, all of them seems to have clawed back. So uh, two things are helping the market sentiment in the near term. Uh, there's a clear dovish tilt by the Fed mm -hmm. in the March 20th meeting. Now, although they keep on going a little bit of back, a little bit back and forth in the subsequent statements. Mm -hmm. But I think on the whole, the tilt is uh, dovish. And second, uh, uh, our strategist was telling us that uh, most two months or three months going into elections, the markets have been strong because mm -hmm. the optimism starts to creep in what the new government will do, uh, things they could not do in the previous term. They'll we'll get manifestos complete. shortly. I mean, I think next week we'll have, we'll get the manifestos, right? And yeah. People will pour over them. Correct. Hopefully they'll be well detailed on the econo eco uh, economic front. Correct. So that should act as a trigger. Yeah, that could act as a trigger. and. Optimism is building up that number of unfinished agendas of the last term could get completed in the next term, etc. This always happens. So, uh, yeah, we could see a near term bit of a move. Medium term, uh, I think the markets will continue to be choppy. That's my view. Okay, so near term you could see a move. But uh, we're getting a lot of questions from viewers, uh, from investors about what happens post the elections, right? Yeah. Because if this is a build up to the elections and once that whole election trigger plays out, then do we normalize to sort of, uh, I mean, are we getting into sort of a time-wise correction for the market? Is it going to be a period of no growth at all? How do we approach it throughout this calendar year? So throughout this calendar year, uh, I've been of the view of the markets, but I call it non-linear. So uh, we saw sort of a linear markets mm -hmm. over the last 12 months. Uh, very small pullbacks and markets kept on rallying. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, I think markets have been non-linear. So you'll see a lot of ups and downs through the year. Uh, for the whole year, I wouldn't be surprised if we close the year in a plus minus 5% range and mm -hmm. not a huge return the way we saw last year. Uh, the reason for that is if you see the earnings performance uh, of the large caps, it's, mm. there's a lot of dispersion trend. So uh, capex oriented or investment oriented businesses are still doing okay, but yeah. they're slightly richly valued. Mm -hmm. uh, consumption weakness, which started with only rural weakness a quarter or two quarters ago, now seems to be percolating upwards even to the urban products and demand. Mm. That's a little bit of a worry. Mm. So uh, there, are, there are cycles and then there are counter cycles which is happening, which in my view is a little bit of a risk for earnings going forward. And the, and the margin benefit which uh, the companies got because of sharp fall in WPI uh, will start to fade away soon. Mm. You know, I was just uh, wondering that some of these commodity prices are moving up. 
what's going to happen to some of those, uh, you know, say those wire makers, those cables companies? You know, suddenly you'll start factoring in that, hey, commodity prices are yeah. going up, but that's what's going to hurt the margin. So let's see how that goes. But since we were on the topic of elections, and I think that you were in the camp that's like two wheelers. You know, what are the other themes you look to play? Staples have been big underperformers. We had a note coming in from Motilal Oswal who said they rather look at staples now in comparison to discretionary, where discretionary actually has been the big outperformer. But they believe the time has come to look at staples. Your take? I, I conclude with slightly negative on staples. Okay. Uh, and the two-wheeler theme you still like? Two-wheeler theme I liked, but I from the current prices and the current valuations, I'm slightly more cautious. Okay. Uh, the stocks have done phenomenal run, for example. Bajaj has done almost 50% kind of a run over the last yes. what, five or six months. Uh, Hero has done beautifully. Mm -hmm. uh, so has TVS. So um, there, there's also how, I mean, market market these tend to price in a uh, year and a half or two years of outlook within months, right? Yeah. So it is, the, the second thing which I've been continuously saying, and I've, I think mentioned this a couple of times on your show, mm. is it's a very retail driven market. Yeah. So two things are happening. One, uh, near-term earnings triggers get immediately priced in. Mm. Uh, second, there is a huge amount of weightage on growth over everything else. So, uh, you know, the, the whole valuation framework of the market keeps on moving. Uh, yes. 2014 to 620, all of us moved to just DCF. And mm. we started talking about terminal value and mm. what's the long-term uh, value in the particular business or stock. I think we have done a full round, round trip and gone back to 90s, which is plain and simple PEG. <laughs> what is the growth and what is the PE relative, relative to that growth? So, which is why when slight amount of growth disappointments, you see sharp pullbacks in the stock prices as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, one is the business. Second is I would keep an eye on what the valuation respective yes. to the growth is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, retail is driving the stock market, but the government is driving uh, some of the policy-led initiatives, right, which is yeah. leading... Uh, outperformance in sectors, infrastructure, capital goods, railways, metros, defense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You said unfinished agenda. Market will focus on uh, very quickly. We'll uh, we'll we'll get to know what what's in the manifestos, etc. But to your mind, I mean, uh, at, at, the, at the team at uh, uh, you know uh, Ambit, what's 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 happening? What's what's the view like? Which are the sectors where this unfinished business will find most resonance in? I think in terms of sectors and specific uh, push with respect to either the CapEx plan or PLI, the government has already done a fantastic job. Mm. Um, what I would like to see, I don't know whether this will happen or not. What I, I like would to like see. to see, <laughs> what I would like to see is the we all have our wish list. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the labor reforms, which was attempted but pulled out, mm. uh, comes back on the table right. uh, with the new mandate. The naval. And naval uh, uh, labor. Labor. Labor yeah. reform, sorry. Uh, labor yes. reforms, okay. which are stabled and okay. sort of pulled back. Okay. Some change, structural changes on the agriculture side, which was also tabled and pulled back mm. uh, in the previous term. I hope some of it comes back because it, it's time we do some, uh, uh, touch some of these holy cows mm. Uh, mm. in the country. And same for land acquisition. Mm. So uh, the, the next big thrust India requires is manufacturing. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, articles and strategy reports being written on why despite the uh, economy doing well and GDP growth being strong, uh, unemployment problem is still not fully solved. So you and need that jobs. can be solved. Yeah. Uh, there is just one thing, uh, if you, the interim budget uh, which came, right, uh, uh, look at the allocations made there, uh, across railways, across roads, uh, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. many of these areas, allocations actually, the growth in allocations has slowed down materially. Correct. And, the, and that's the reason uh, many economists point out that there's only so much the government can do. Correct. Right? Uh, there's absorptive capacity of the economy as well. You can't just keep uh, putting in money into these sectors. That will not change even as they come back. So uh, what does that mean for, you know, as, as a theme is great, you know, capital goods and uh, PLI, etc. But you're reaching limits in terms of how much more the government can do. It's the private sector then. Yeah. Uh, will that show up in that way in stocks as well? That maybe they take a back seat we you know, that remains the focus, but the government is is kind of taking a back seat, as they've told us, and that perhaps will not change when the full budget also comes. Not necessarily, because mm. um, uh, see, many many of these companies have notched up uh, order book, mm. so book to bill ratio is reaching three and a half, four, four and a half times, right? Now, I'll just give an example of BHL from two thousand three to seven, mm. or two thousand and four to seven, mm. just to illustrate my point. So, bulk of the order book for BHL actually came pre-2004. Mm. Uh, 
uh, but bulk of the execution happened between 4 to 7. Mm. Um, and while generally it is believed that capital goods companies perform only when the orders come in and not when the earnings are delivered, it's not really so. Mm. So capital goods start to perform when the, uh, when the orders start to come in. But if the earnings growth is also very strong, the performance continues. So over four to seven BHL delivered on the projects, uh, executed, mm -hmm. and uh, in uh, power projects, typically the last two years is when most of the margins also get booked. So mm -hmm. as the projects come for completion, the margins also see a bump up. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the best performing stocks of that time period. So same thing can happen here. Mm -hmm. Uh, fresh order intake might slow down, but book to bill is four times, four and a half times in many of these cases. Uh, as they get executed and towards the second half of execution is where bulk of the margins get booked. Uh, earnings growth can still stay robust. Okay, by the way, the stock of the moment is Avenue Supermar. Just look at that 5.5% rally now on that stock and big volumes coming through as well on Avenue Supermar this morning. Um, it's, uh, you know, the market cap has now exceeded over 3 lakh crores for Avenue Supermar. It has come back in a big way. It just talks about how perhaps consumption has come back, right? But just trying to uh, you, to get your view on this entire sector, how do you pick and choose um, in terms of both valuation as well as growth now? So, uh, two or three things. One is, um, I mean, one of the biggest trend in the consumption sector is formalization. That trend started in, let's say, 2017 or 18, gathered pace uh, post-2020-21. So, there are a few spaces, and Avenue is a classic example of that, right? So, there are a few spaces within the consumption space where even if the headline growth is a little slower, uh, some of the stronger names in the sector can continue to grow at a very fast clip because informal is still a large uh, part of the pie as compared to the formal. So, uh, grocery retail is one such example where informal is still a small fraction. And hence, uh, the more organized retail in grocery has a very long runway of growth, which is what Avenue is benefiting from, the growth had slowed down a bit, a small sign of a pickup in the last two quarters and the stock's been doing very well. Uh, there are there are a few spaces, I mean jewelry is another such example, where mm. still the unorganized has a large uh, section of the whole pie and hence the organized can... So at this price yeah. and at these valuations, you're still comfortable with names like Avenue? I mean, I'm not commenting on the specific sure, sure. stock price move here, but I think that's... Your, you asked me a question on what the framework one should use. The framework I think one should use is uh, if there is still large informal to formal shift happening, yeah. at least one, thing, one can take a bet on a longer runway for growth. Okay. And then, I mean, valuations is another matter. You have to link oh. it. All right, Deeraj, appreciate you coming down to the studio and sharing all those thoughts with us. Wishing you a good day ahead and look forward to having a chat with you rather soon. Sure, thank well, you. Well, let's focus on another company then, BEML. Well, that could be... Uh, you know, that is a big Make in India theme, and also it has exposure to various segments, whether it's metros, railways, defense, all those segments are flourishing, and the company will be at the center of it. Well, to understand more about how business is shaping up, we're joined by Mr. Shantanu Roy, the CMD of the company. Hi, Mr. Roy, good morning, and always good to speak to you. Well, let's get the basics out of the way. You've won some orders in the last quarter, so give us an updated order book and break it up segment-wise as well. Very good morning, Nigel. Uh, we definitely have won some orders in the last quarter as well as the last financial year. And the new financial year is, is again a new beginning for us. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot talk about uh, the present order book that we have since uh, we are in the silent period now. But I can give you a glimpse of uh, the order book of the opportunity size. So talking about uh, the defense opportunity size for 24-25, uh, uh, we have an opportunity size of around 6,000 crores. If, it, if I talk about the rail and metro uh, business vertical, we have an opportunity size of around 58,000 crores, out of which around 44,000 crore will be from the rail and 14,000 crore will be from the metro. And if I talk about the mining, mining has always uh, been uh, like that in uh, an opportunity size of around 3,000 crores every year. And uh, that has been giving us a baseline till now. Mm. Okay. And wh how optimistic are you that you can get a bulk of this? Defense, I think you mentioned 6,000 crores, rail and metro 58,000 crores, and mining 3,000 crores. What should be a rough hit ratio? This is the opportunity size, I'm guessing. And you would get yeah. some part of this. Yes. Uh, well, uh, the rough hit estimate should be around 50%. Uh, 
in That's rail and metro as well as mining as well as defense whereas in mining it should be more than 80% hmm okay so in defense particularly you're saying 50% so around 3000 crores but the last time when we spoke to you you had said that in the next 3 to 4 years you can expect about 7 8000 crores of defense orders do you stand by that uh, you know long term target and if you can tell us where do you see the maximum opportunity in the defense space is it in high mobility vehicles is it in armor recovery vehicles you know just trying to understand where is the traction now uh you are very right you know let me correct you a bit the opportunity size that i spoke about is for 24 mm. 25 okay. and uh, okay. when, I, when i said that uh, we can look at a, a number of around 6000 to 7000 crore what i meant mm. was that uh, it will it will be the sales numbers in the uh, in the coming 4 to 5 years now the opportunity size for us in the segments in the core capabilities that we have presently for the coming uh 4 to 5 years is around 40000 crores and uh, the bulk of it will come from the high mobility vehicles the bulk of it will come from the combat engineering the bulk of it will come from the armored uh, vehicles i'm not talking about you know the diversification efforts uh, that we'll be putting on uh, especially you know the new business areas new growth areas if uh, we are able to do that this opportunity size will definitely double Okay so that is for defense got it just to follow up on the metro order book as well you said the opportunity size is 14000 crores and from that you are expecting to bag about 50% uh, so we're looking at about 7000 crores for FY25 correct me if i'm wrong and from that 7000 crores can you tell us you know what are the different projects across regions bangalore mumbai hyderabad what is the kind of visibility that you have in terms of both getting orders as well as execution in the next 1 to 2 years first let me talk about the order book uh, the order opportunities order opportunity is the chennai metro uh, there are two projects in chennai uh, then mumbai we have three projects which have already been announced the tender is out we also have uh, you know uh, some extension in the existing order book for bangalore metro we will have uh, more opportunity for the bangalore metro the new lines that have been announced we also have the patna metro so these are the opportunities that are uh right there in front of us as far as the execution is concerned we have uh, basically two projects in metro which are under uh, execution one is the mumbai metro line 2 line 7 and the second is the bangalore metro uh, for the 318 cars so these are the two projects which are under execution presently mm. mr roy good morning good to see you uh, back in the program sir uh, so you know for each of these segments defense rail and metro what is the outline of a visible pipeline over the next couple of years if you can give us those numbers uh well i think i gave you an outline about the uh, is 24 25 that, financial year yeah, and i also beyond 24 outline about the next 4 uh, to 5 years in uh, defense and rail and metro so right. uh, we can we can extrapolate from that basically and it okay. may, it need not be you know double in the next year so what i can see is that from the rail and metro uh, sector itself there can be an opportunity size of around 90000 crores in the couple of in next couple of years including this year and from the defense and aerospace it should be around 50000 crore for uh, sorry it should be around uh, 12 to 15000 crore for bml mm. uh, specifically on defense and defense vehicles right armored vehicles etc which is a big focus area for the government i mean to strengthen uh, border security etc could you tell us what is the uh is is it going to be a, a fast growing uh, segment as you see it and what can be uh, the opportunity size here uh, mr roy uh well uh, if i uh, if we talk about the numbers you know the opportunity mm. size that we are presently having is around 6000 crore which hovers around the high mobility vehicle and as well as the armored vehicles and uh, there are various uh, uh, variants of uh, the high mobility vehicle for different usages for example the uh, platforms for the missile systems platforms for the strategic forces command so all put together this number that i have just mentioned is all put together and uh, uh, in the coming years also uh, the 40000 crore of opportunity size that i just mentioned it also is basically from the high mobility vehicle and the armored recovery vehicle plus various variants of uh, the same uh, as i said uh, you know uh, these are our core competencies 
and the core competencies are uh, the armored recovery vehicle, the high mobility vehicle, the combat engineering, the bridging systems which form a part of the combat engineering, the mining, demining, mine layering equipment which again are uh, part of our uh, combat engineering segment. And on top of this, uh, we have developed some new capabilities in engines. So that should augur well for the company, uh, especially for uh, the main battle tanks that are to come in the future, as well as the existing fleet of uh, the main battle tanks. Mm, just a very near-term question, Mr. Roy. Uh, in the in this, uh, you know, with elections uh, sort of upon us, will the first quarter largely be uh, sort of? Uh, you know, very small in as far as order, fresh order intake is concerned, or work goes on. Work you goes see, on, work but time oh, work, tendering, work, order, ordering, yeah. Work definitely goes on. Already, certain uh, uh, all these all these opportunities are in the pipeline. But yes, it hmm. may not fructify in the first quarter. It may go up to the second quarter or the third quarter. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Roy, just to confirm, you know, so your order book is looking good. The order book opportunity as well is solid. So, you know, most analysts on the street, they believe that you can grow in high teens to around 20% on a CAGR basis for the next few years. That's doable, right? It is definitely doable. Okay. Uh, you see, uh, uh, the last year, as I as I yeah. said, yeah, it was a survive, revive and thrive. So, last year was survival for us. This right. year will be a year of consolidation for us. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Last year, we also had three signature moves which will drive the company forward. One was the mm. engine, second was the Vande Bharat, and the third yeah. was the high-end mining equipment that we developed. And okay. uh, uh, we can we can also expect at more signature moves from the company in the coming years, in the coming couple of years. Okay, all right. So revenue growth of roughly around, on an average, CAGR of close to around 18 to 20% is what we can work with. That's the takeaway that I'm getting for the next three, four years. Okay. We can work Got with. Yes. All right, let's work. That, 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 that is an uphill task, I must say. That's an uphill task. And what's gettable? 15%, 15, 16%? Is that gettable? You see, we are aiming at 20%. 20%, got it. Okay, so revenue growth is out of the way. I want to focus on margins. I'm reading a Prabhudas Leela the note. And they're saying that they expect margins to scale to 13 13.6% in comparison to around that 10%. And the reason they've given is 25% of your workforce is expected to retire in the next two years. So employee cost as a percentage of sales will drop around 370 basis points. Do you think that's well and truly on? FY26, the margins are closer to around 14%? You see, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult for me to, uh, you know, envisage that as uh, at this point of time. What I can say is that the employee cost, we will try to keep it around 20% or around 18%. I don't see it coming down drastically. Number two, even if 25% of the workforce is going to retire in the next couple of years, we are going to have new people on board. In fact, we have already started a massive recruitment drive and uh, uh, the, the guys that we have recruited, they are expected to come on board by uh, uh, May. Mm -hmm. And if we have to grow, we need a workforce also. So uh, the uh, absolute numbers may go up in terms of the revenue cost, in terms of the employee cost, sorry. Uh, but the percentage is likely to remain at around this number only. And as mm. far as the margins are concerned, mm. uh, as I said earlier, definitely it will be a much improved number uh, this year. Uh, we will, uh, we are expected to hit uh, uh, good numbers. Let us see how it uh, mm. happens. And in the future also, the number that uh, has been speculated, it may happen if, our, if we are able to achieve our sales numbers. Because we have a, uh, fixed cost, which remains more or less uh, the fixed in number. So as as much as the revenue goes up, our margins also go up. Okay, got that. So simple, uh, you spoke about. Combo. Okay, you spoke about uh, you know a ninety thousand crore opportunity size in the next two to three years in rail and metro. I also want to understand: Are there any uh, is there any pickup in activity in the international business? Because so far it's a very small portion. But I do know from the last time we chatted that you are looking to expand your presence there. Can you tell us what the next two to three years would look like and what's the opportunity size? Uh, well, in international business, uh, traditionally, we have uh, done only mining construction. 95% of our exports has been through mining and construction only. Uh, however, uh, we are working on a couple of uh, international projects for the metro sector. And uh, we are also trying to uh, uh, have our maiden entry in the defense exports. 
So as far as the opportunity size is concerned, it is huge in the international market. But mm -hmm. we would like to grow at uh, maybe uh, five percent to ten percent as far as our exports are concerned in the coming two to three years. So this international metro projects, any idea on what the ballpark size could be uh, in terms of crores? What are we looking at over the next two to three years, and which geographies are you seeing maximum demand coming from? Uh, the geographies are uh, basically the Middle East and uh, South America. And uh, if I talk about the ballpark figure, it should be in the range of around 2,000, 2,500 crores as far as the rolling mm. stock is. That's mm. over how many years? That will be over the two to three years. Normally, that is the time which is needed for the execution. Okay. Uh, Mr. Roy, uh, you know, on that uh, uh, Nigel's question on margins, you know, last time we spoke, uh, I think this was late Feb, you'd said that there is some reorganization of the company which is underway. And we'll hear more about it soon. Uh, is, is there anything you'd want to update us with, sir? Yeah, we have uh, just uh, restructured the organization, uh, done a complete mm. restructuring into mm. strategic business units uh, to have more focus, to have uh, a better efficiency, to have faster decision making, and also creating leaders, uh, a leadership pipeline. So we have just implemented it. We have rolled it out from 1st of April. And uh, the results will take some time to come, but I'm very uh, hopeful that uh, it will uh, be beneficial for the company. A lot of other organizations have already uh, are already working uh, with this model and they have been pretty successful. So this is a tested model, time-tested model. And we are also pretty confident uh, that this will uh, uh, reap uh, very good dividends for the company. Hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, rolled out from the 1st of April, as you say, and we'll, so, uh, we'll see results over a period of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Roy. Good speaking with you, sir. Appreciate you joining in here on CNBC TV 18. Well, uh, we'll slip into a break here. Just another reminder of, uh, you know, uh, the event later today, that is India Exchange, which CNBC TV 18 is hosting, uh, where market experts, industry stalwarts will collaborate in insightful discussions on India's economic path and the evolving dynamics of the Indian market. Mapping macros with city economist Samir and Chakrabarti later in the evening. There's a jugal bandi between market veterans Manish Chokani and Ramdeo Garwal. Return of Animal Spirits, V. Vaidyanathan. A KK Mystery, Manish Kejriwal. Way in and chasing Alpha with market experts Nilesh Shah, Prashant Kemka and Vaido Capital. Uh, Anish Tawakle will also join us. Uh, so tune in to CNBC TV 18 today evening, 5.30pm onwards. Welcome back. Avenue Supermarts reported a very good set of numbers. So let's find out what some of the other players are doing in this market. Vmart Retail came out with their Q4 business update. That showed an improvement sequentially. The Q4 same store sales growth came in at 6% versus 4% in Q3. The company added 9 new stores in Q4, taking the total store count at 444. Now to discuss the demand trends, we are joined by Anand Agarwal, the CFO of Vmart Retail. Anand, thanks a lot. Uh, for joining us. So your numbers are showing an improvement on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. But uh, is that just because of a favourable base, a low base? Or have you seen a genuine improvement in consumer demand? Well, I think there is definitely some improvement at the ground level. Uh, we've been saying that in the past couple of quarters as well. So last three to six months have definitely improved. So there are two factors which are working here. One is there is definitely a slight improvement in the consumer demand uh, in the footfalls as well. Uh, and second also is a lot of uh, effort that we had put in over the last one, one and a half years in improving our internal efficiency in terms of uh, you know the designs, in terms of the product that we are putting in and also the price proposition 
that we are able to provide to the customer at a more sharper price point is, uh, I think, yielding a bit of results. Uh, it's too early to say that, you know, whether uh, this is going to, you know, grow further or, you know, how much it is going to grow. But definitely, I, I can definitely say that, you know, there is some improvement in the ground level and also some of the internal efficiencies that we've been building on have started to bore results. Okay, but despite an improvement in the ground level, you continue to see a single digit, low single digit same store sales growth. By when do you think you can get to double digit? Uh, very difficult to predict, but uh, all our efforts are always to maximize the growth. Uh, but I think in the midterm, uh, I think we will still be wanting to, you know, make sure that we at least stick to high single digits. And that's what the goal uh, the team has taken up. And we are all gunning to make sure that we at least reach there. If we are able to surpass that, that's even better. But that's something that uh, definitely we want to target. Okay. All right. Hi, Mr. Agarwal. Good morning and good to see you in and good to hear that you're seeing at least some signs of improvement. We'll take that same store sales growth of high single digit for the coming year. I want to focus a little on margins. You know, and the acquired unit that you did, uh, the acquisition that you did a couple of years ago was unlimited. Now, out there, the margins are still relatively lower in comparison to the core business. When do you see it coming up to steam with uh, what you're doing at VMart? I think we acquired Unlimited two years back and the last yes. two years have really been a turnaround story. We've been building True. a lot uh, of in terms of how we integrate the product, how we change the product, how we uh, get to a new set of customers who are more attuned to our style of offering of value products. And all of that is now started to show some results because we've also seen a 13% like to like growth in the Unlimited business in the last quarter. Now, as far as the margins are concerned, I think once we achieve a uh, sales per square feet, uh, you know, increment of at least 15 to 20 percent uh, in the next one year or, or, you know, or so, we should be able to look at more healthier margin, which are more comparable to the group margins uh, at, a, you know, a much more healthier level. Uh, you know, I just had one follow up. You said same store sales growth currently at about 6 percent. You're expecting it to go to high single digits. But I'm just trying to understand, you know, some of the, your peers, like say a V2 retail, right? I mean, they saw a growth of 40% in Q4. Uh, both of you are literally in the same business, but you're struggling to even see a 10% growth. Uh, why is that? I really don't want to comment on competitors, but definitely I think what we are trying to do is to make sure that we are able to leverage all our strengths and improve our operations and, uh, you know, gun towards a more sustainable growth, which we can deliver quarter on quarter. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Agarwal, uh, good morning, Prashant here. Sli slightly out of the box question and uh, forgive me if uh, maybe I'm going off tangent, but this is an area, I mean, you've got the network, uh, right, in, uh, in these, in the, in the, especially so in the Hindi heartland states. Uh, have, you, have you gotten uh, sort of offers from competitors, etc.? Uh, uh, is there, is there, I mean, some sort of a M&A, etc. We could, we could, we could perhaps look at. Is that a possibility at all, or nothing at all? Definitely not. Uh, at least I am not privy to any such offers. And even if I had something, I would definitely not announce it on national television. <laughs> but you don't. But you're saying you don't have anything, right? Nothing is, uh, nothing has come up to no. you. No. What if someone offered you? <laughs> I think I'll take it offline then. Okay. <laughs> but okay. you're saying that you don't have it as of now. Uh, so tell us, uh, you know, elections is a big time, right? Uh, in the in uh, UP, Bihar, Jhar, uh, all the states where you operate in. Uh, how is demand kind of uh, holding up uh, ahead, of, ahead of polling, which is expected to start? So right now, as I said, I think the demand is definitely looking up. We are seeing more renewed footfalls. We are, in, we are seeing much better conversions. We are seeing much better offtake in all the Hindi heartland markets. In fact, these markets have been particularly been disturbed because of two years of bad monsoons, consecutive two years of bad monsoons. And uh, this time around, we are definitely seeing a lot of interest. Now, the only challenge which I foresee in the next, at least uh, around the time of elections, is elections usually are very disruptive, and especially in the rural areas. So whenever we, uh, there are rallies or, you know, uh, events, uh, the towns do get disrupted and that's uh, a bit of a challenge. The second challenge also that I foresee is that, you know, quarter one this year unusually has very low number of marriage, uh, you know, uh, auspicious marriage, marriage days. So there, mm. there might be a bit of challenge at least in quarter one, but otherwise at a more sustainable level, I'm definitely seeing, uh, you know, at least for the last three to six months, uh, uh, footfalls firming up, demand getting better, definitely as compared to the last two years. 
Okay. And uh, you know, we were just talking about competition and how competition is doing very well. I understand that it must be a tough time for you, you know, uh, trying to navigate that. But anything that you are doing to sort of combat competition in terms of either pricing or penetrating the market further and also in terms of store additions, what are we looking at in FY25? So we have opened roughly around 46 stores gross this year and we also closed 19 non-performing stores this year and we've been on a cleanup spree for the last two years at least and uh, I think in terms of store additions we should be looking at around 45 to 50 gross store additions next year as well uh, or sorry in the current financial year FI25. Uh, there may be a bit of store closures again maybe not uh, more than 5 to 10 but uh, that's what we have already planned for. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the internal improvements, I think uh, we've done a lot of work around our merchandise, a lot of work around how we supply to replenish to the stores, courtesy the new warehouse that we have set up, which is now fully operational. So there's a lot of improvement which has happened around the pricing and the value proposition that we are able to offer to the customer. And uh, with this renewed product offering and much more fashion, because we have now also set up a full design team, which has been in the works for the last one, one and a half years. So almost 40, 50 percent of the uh, products now that we sell at our stores is now internally designed. And that's a very, very big uh, departure from our earlier, uh, you know, avatar. The second very big work that we have done is around quality improvement. So uh, I can very safely say that amongst all our competitors and amongst all our peers, uh, we would have the best quality at the price at which we are able to provide products to the customer. And that purely reflects in the loyalty rates that we are able to enjoy. So our loyalty rates have inched up from 60% to almost 70%. And that's the kind of uh, sustainable growth that we are trying to build, uh, in, both in terms of product offering as well as customer offering. So that's the mode that we are trying to develop on. Apart from the expansion that we have been, you know, doing in our core areas, not really, you know, mm -hmm. dithering away to into newer geographies, but basically getting into the cluster-based, uh, you know, expansion that we have always specialized in. Okay, all right. Final question, Mr. Agarwal. Then you told us about Unlimited. What about Lime Road? How far away is it from breaking even? You know, Motilal Oswal has come out with the note, and they are saying from a loss of close to around 60 crores, they're expected to breaking to they expected to break even in FI25. It's on course? So I'm not too sure whether we'll be able to break even at a full year basis, but definitely by the end of next year, we are definitely looking to break even that business, maybe in the exit quarter or so. Uh, but definitely the work that we've been doing is that we've been consec uh, uh, consecutively bringing down the losses every quarter. And that is what we will keep doing uh, without compromising on a lot of you know growth. But at the same time, at Line Road, uh, the objective is not basically to build it as a top line engine, as I said earlier as well. The objective yeah. is to make it sustainable and aid in the omnification of the overall VMART group. So okay. the uh, offline customer at VMART stores is able to shop seamlessly on Line Road and vice versa is something that we are you know, trying to build. Good to hear your thoughts, Mr. Agarwal. We appreciate you joining in. Wishing you all the best. and. Hopefully, FY25 will be a cracker for you as well as your team. Well, let's get back to the markets. You know, from the time we have opened up, actually, it's been a, a bit of a party pooper because we started off we were fresh all-time highs. We were up more than 100 points. You know, the batsmen came out there, smacking it out of the park. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, quite a few wickets have tumbled in the last few minutes. And that's why the Nifty now has moved into the red. We're down close to 35 points. And we made this point earlier today. The start is going, going to be in the green, but we need to build on to that. In fact, the start was much better than what we anticipated. But take a look at a few stocks. Hero Motor Corp has moved to the low point of the day. Shriram Finance as well has seen a bit of a U-turn of sorts. So that stock is well moving lower. And I think a couple of larger names as well, like Infosys, l &T, When they turn, that's what puts pressure. And that's precisely what's taking place. Prashant, the batting order is looking a little bit sticky now. <laughs> well, you know, uh, market breadth is also closed in uh, now, now, Nigel. So we're back below the 22, uh, 526 level, right? Once again. Uh, so... Uh, neither here nor there. Uh, look at the advanced decline ratio. It's kind of closed the gap now uh, on the indices. But I also think it's important to point out that given everything, the bank nifty has been supporting this market quite a bit. So mm. bank nifty continues to be in the green, although it's come off a bit. 
and it's sitting at a one month high so you know the consistent performance in the last one month so maybe banks continue to play leadership here i think the biggest constituent you no know, hdfc bank HDFC that's actually bank. dragging the bank if you pull up a contribution chart i think bulk of the 250 points will be because of hdfc bank mm -hmm. that's been the big uh, drag on the index yeah. and if that comes to the party then it's going to be very very good times all right uh, well let's uh, shift focus to brigade enterprises the next company that we're speaking with uh, it's been a huge uh, outperformer 100% plus in the last one year so there's a new development. They've signed, Brigade has signed a joint development agreement with uh, United Oxygen to develop a 3 million square feet office space in Bengaluru. The project is expected to generate a gross development value of around 340 crore rupees. Well, let's discuss this a little bit more. Nirupa Shankar is Joint Managing Director at uh, Brigade Enterprises. Nirupa, great to have you with us here. Uh, good morning. Thanks for your time. Prashant, this side, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, how much investment would you be putting in uh, towards this project? Uh, you know, is this going to be the first of many? Are you, do you already work with this particular player? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, just, just uh, basic hygiene details. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm not sure if I'm uh, uh, visible to you all, but uh, good morning we, to you. We can um, hear you clearly, so yes. Anirupa. Yeah, go on. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is a joint development project in Whitefield in East Bangalore, which is known to be one of the, uh, you know, I think one of the very good markets for office absorption in the city. Uh, Bangalore as well has been doing extremely well from an office absorption perspective. And uh, this is the first time we're doing the project with this particular landowner and hope to do much more. And uh, uh, in terms of investment, uh, you know, it's a three lakh square feet uh, project. And uh, we'll be putting in the average construction cost of, uh, uh, that we have for all our projects. And, uh, yeah, we're very excited because it's right on the main road, good metro connectivity, and I feel that has been the key for new office absorption, um, having uh, good metro connectivity, having good public transport, having good visibility. So we're excited about this. So this gro uh, uh, when you say gross development value, this is office space, right? So we should look at it as, uh, as, as, as uh, lease and rental kind of annuity uh, earnings yeah. from yeah. this project? So yes, this is uh, office space, but when we put in the GDV, what we do is we take a um, assumed rental value and we divide it by a cap rate and figure out, suppose we were to sell it, what could we expect from the sales of this project if we were to sell it? But not necessarily, uh, do you know, is this a project that we plan to sell? Uh, we are planning to lease uh, this project initially and then let, let, let's see. It's just for GDV purposes, certain assumptions are made. Okay. Nirupa, hi. Good morning. I want to uh, your, uh, you know, views on what the rentals could look like. What are the realizations? What are the rentals that you're seeing right now in the commercial space? And how is it compared to what it was, say, six months ago? See, the rentals have been quite stable. Um, every year, there is typically a 5% escalation in most contracts. We've been able to hold on to that kind of an increase annually. So, despite COVID, um, you know, we've been we've been able to ha handle a five percent increase for in our rentals. So, today in White, uh, rentals are anywhere between uh, sixty to sixty-five rupees for a grade A project. Uh, sometimes it could be lower for older projects. Could be in the range of uh, between as well older projects and depending on the location. But projects with good location. Um, and, um, you know, road facing and marquee projects are getting at least mm -hmm. between 60 to 65. Now, in three years, the way we estimate it is, you know, with a 5% increase per annum, um, uh, what we can expect there. So, in three years, I would increase 15% over the existing rentals and assume that value for a rental in three years. So, can you give us for this particular project with United Oxygen, uh, what is the expected rental or realizations that you're looking at? So, for instance, in the GDV, as I mentioned, it's about, we've mentioned about 340-odd crores. So, the mm -hmm. assumed rental is around uh, 75 in this case. And how much of money are you investing in this uh, uh, JV? See, typically, it's a joint development. It's not a, jo okay. a joint venture. Typically, okay. uh, we, all, we do our projects as a mix of 50% uh, debt and 50% equity. That's typically what the, um, um, you know, the financials work out. So, Accordingly, we put in the average construction cost. Typically, average construction cost, again, it can range anywhere from uh, 3,500 to 4,000 rupees per square foot plus GST and other expenses. So, in terms of an absolute number, what will it be for the project, for the J uh, JDA that you're talking about? Absolute terms? I'll have to 
calculate that. I'll have to calculate that. But like I said, it's a three lakh square feet building, and um, I've given you the construction cost. Yeah. Got it. And uh, just to reconfirm, uh, uh, for the end of this year, you were targeting around seven hundred crores of rentals, right? For the piece, for the entire uh, company and the whole. Yes, that's right. That's right, including our office and retail portfolio. Mm. Nirupa, we can see you as well now. <laughs> so, uh, good, uh, good to have your video on as well. Just one thing, uh, Nirupa. Uh, so, uh, is, the, uh, is the market look as, as buoyant, uh, as, as strong, uh, even as a lot of new supply also uh, keeps coming in, uh, the Bangalore market? Yeah, I think the market is very strong. You know, overall in real estate, we're seeing decadal highs across most industries, whether it's uh, residential, whether it's hospitality, whether it's uh, retail is also doing extremely well from a sales perspective and sales volume perspective. Um, the office market as well has it has been quite resilient. In fact, uh, quarter on quarter, I think for the market overall, uh, there's been a, almost a 40% increase in the overall country market. So I think for this quarter, I think the country has done about 11 million odd square feet of office absorption. And I would say 50% of that can come from markets like Bangalore, Chennai and Hyderabad. So overall, we are seeing a pretty resilient market. I know that India is sort of a bright spark uh, across what we see globally. You know, globally, there is a bit of gloom and doom when it comes to office, whether it's the US or Europe or Australia and markets like that. But India and Asia, but India specifically, has been uh, quite resilient in the whole office absorption space. So we are seeing pretty good traction and we hope that this momentum continues. So do you have any plans to expand into new geographies like some of your peers, like Prestige, for example, is getting into Bombay in a big way, gotten into Bombay in a big way. Uh, do you have any plans and what is the land bank that you're looking at right now? Uh, are you looking at more land buys or expansion? Um, you know, we've held on to this uh, statement for a while, saying that uh, we will be continuing in to focus on our key markets of Bangalore, uh, Chennai and Hyderabad. Of course, there are other smaller markets that we may look at for some amount of office, such as Kochi. Uh, Gibbs City is also a place where we have some presence. So it, Gibbs City is doing quite well right now. So we might look to uh, do something more there. Uh, but apart from that, we typically, again, our strategy has been a mixture of outright and joint development. For office especially, we've been doing a lot more joint development, um, just because commercially that makes a lot more sense for us. All right, Nirupa, final question before we let you go, both for your company as well as for the industry on the whole, what has been the impact of the water crisis on construction? Uh, tell us more. Yeah, I think water crisis is hitting certain parts of Bangalore. If you look at it, the north side of Bangalore, the west and the south are not so badly hit. I think the, the, the grave water crisis is mostly in the eastern parts of Bangalore. Uh, what we need to do as responsible builders is to make sure that we use uh, only treated water uh, for construction purposes, don't use fresh water for construction. We have to make sure that, you know, we do all our rainwater harvesting uh, recharge pits. We need to increase the water table in all our projects. So we need to make sure that uh, we house a lot of rainwater, make sure that um, uh, anytime the rains fall, we're able to again harvest all that water. And those are the measures all of us need to take. You know, it's possible... Uh, it's possible to have water surplus in some of our projects. We've seen that even in uh, East Bangalore projects, some of them have water surplus because of the responsible measures we have taken. But that said, you know, it is a great situation in East Bangalore. And I think um, as a city and as builders, we need to sort of uh, make sure we do all the responsible things uh, required to harness as much of the rainwater as possible and store it and use it effectively. And of course, treat as much as the wastewater and make sure we're all net zero water. Okay, well, very important there. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Nirupa, for joining in and appreciate your thoughts here on CNBC TV 18. Well, for the market, it's not bad. It's just consolidating around the 22,400 level. Uh, the mid-cap index is actually doing quite well at the moment, up 134 points. And the bank nifty is supporting the market. So the mid-cap index has picked up from the lows. Some dips are getting bought. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, we'll put focus on the commodity space. Manisha Gupta will be joining in. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Well, I just want to point out a couple of stocks that are hitting fresh highs, although the market may be flat. Just take a look at it. Uh, Indian hotels is now at a fresh high, and this entire tourism space has been playing out very well. Uh, the other stock to look at is Inox India. Now, if you remember, Inox India, the IPO came in uh, December of last year at around uh, 600 or so. The stock today is at 1300. Big moves coming in on Inox India. The issue price was 627 rupees. It had a strong listing and now it's built on to its gains more than doubled from its uh, IPO issue price. But Mitesh Thakkar is here with us to give us more views on the market. Mitesh, what are the stocks that you're looking at? Yeah, I think, you know, there's some negative crossover on the charts of Reliance, so there could be profit booking. So, you know, very, uh, you know, a small pullback can happen. Take a shot at the stock at 2950 and a target of around 2880 or thereabouts uh, can happen over here. And the other stock which I like is um, Bharat Ford, which I would recommend buying once it crosses uh, 1155. So, it's making a bullish pattern, it needs to give a breakout about 1155. Buy then with the stock at 1137 for targets of 12. All right, thanks a lot for that. Let's hop across to Manisha Gupta now to tell us about uh, the commodity markets and what she's tracking there. Manisha. Thank you for that, Sonia. Well, I'm looking at metals which are definitely on a high. There's a lot of support coming in for the sector from the way the dollar index has been behaving. From a four and a half month highs, we've seen the prices decline by 1% and that has been supportive. Also, the US Fed Powell statements yesterday where he said that lower policy interest rates would likely to be appropriate at some point in time in this year itself is where the gold and silver prices and metals seem to be taking a lot of support from. And then there are geopolitical tensions in Middle East. Markets still are looking at uh, uh, the impacts of earthquake that is in Taiwan. So tangible commodities actually are getting bought into. Also strong economic data that we saw come in from China for the month of Feb and for the month of March as well have been quite supportive. I want to take you through various metals on and how they are trading at this point in time. So starting with copper, that one is at a 13-month high. It's trading very close to all-time highs in China. Aluminum has surged quite strongly. It has been an outperformer for last week or so. 13-month highs on that as well. Zinc has been jumping up nine weeks high on that. Silver clearly has been an outperformer within the precious metal space in last couple of sessions. 26-week highs on that. And silver in last two days have jumped up by nearly 8%. Platinum also is trading at a 12-week highs. Actually, the way we buy gold in India is how Chinese buy platinum in sense of weddings and, uh, you know, uh, rings, etc. So China's retail buying also has been on the stronger side. But the price clearly goes to gold, which has extended rally to record highs, now trading above $2,300 $2, an ounce. When you look at the June futures there, they are trading at $2,325 right now. So there is a big contango and you are looking at the further months actually trading much in the positive for the Indian market, 70,000 is done now. And if you are going out, stepping out to buy 24 carats gold, adding all the taxes and everything, it comes to 72,000 per 10 grams of gold in the physical markets there. This is what we've done on a week on week and a month on month basis. So gold is gained up by three and a half percent in this week is up 10 percent on month. Silver outperforming with nine percent of gains and 15 percent in last one month. Platinum as well continues to do well. I also want to bring in the industrial metals right now because we've seen stronger gains come in for this. In that case as well, copper, aluminum and zinc have done quite well. We've seen nearly 6 to 5 percent of gains on a week on week basis and 5 to 11 percent of a jump up on industrial metals in last one month as well. What the street will now watch out for clearly is going to be the FOMC meeting on 10th and 11th of June. But ahead of that, it is the US non-farm payroll data. Well, that comes in on Friday. All right, let's slip into a quick break on that note. On the other side, we will be joined by Ajay Agarwal, the co-founder of Go Auto, and Vinkesh Gulati, the chairman research at FADA, to discuss the fall that we've seen in EV demand globally. Remember, Tesla last week announced that their sales in Q1 fell 9% a fall in sales for the first time in four years. So we are going to talk about whether there is a big slowdown underway and what are the key trends in India. More on that coming in.
Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Well, globally, the demand for electric vehicles seems to be slowing down. Last week, Tesla reported a 9% year-on-year fall in sales, which is its first year-on-year fall in the last four years. And Tesla spoke about how competition has heated up. In fact, in the letter to its investors in January, Tesla predicted notably lower sales growth this year. What does this mean for the Indian EV market, which is in any case struggling with pe uh, penetration? especially in the passenger vehicle space. We have Ajay Agarwal, the co-founder of Go Auto, and Vinkesh Gulati, the chairman research at FADA, joining us now. Gentlemen, morning to both of you. Ajay, let me start with you. This kind of slowdown that we've seen in the large EV players globally, do you think this is a blip or is it structural in nature? Uh, it's. I feel it's just a blip. In India, it has not been the same story. The Indian market has been growing. If you see, compared to last year, the Indian growth in passenger vehicle was almost 45-50%. So I don't see that Indian market getting impacted by the global trends on EV. Okay, so this is just a blip you're saying. Got that. Yeah. Uh, Vinkesh, what about you? What are your thoughts? Because, you know, Tesla has seen, is also coming off a very high base, right? I mean, it's in consistent growth over the last many years. And this is the first time in four years it's seen a bit of a knockdown. Do you concur with Ajay's view that this could be just a you know, one or two month phenomenon and the structural growth story is still intact globally? So, uh, I feel yes, it's a blip, but uh, the kind of growth or the kind of positiveness we have been seeing in EV for so long abroad, uh, I feel the story is not similar going further. So, after the blip, whenever we see in two, three months, the EV going up uh, uh, globally, it won't be at the same rate how we have seen for the past five years. Mm -hmm. But like Ajay said, he's totally right. India is a different story. But when I talk of globally, it has been uh, many years since uh, EV is prevalent there. Uh, it has been stabilized there. People have experienced three years, five years down the line, knows the positives of uh, uh, running an EV for more than five years. So obviously, it's not in the same positive mode as it is in India today. Okay, got that. Uh, so, India is a very different story is what you're saying, right? So, let's talk about the Indian market. Uh, and I wanted uh, Ajay's view first on this. Ajay, you know, if you look at the PV, the passenger vehicle electric market in India, uh, the adoption is very low at just about 2 odd percent. It could be for several reasons. There are limited model choices. The price points are much higher. The EV adoption itself has struggled quite a bit because of, uh, you know, range anxiety issues, charging infrastructure issues. But where are we right now? And what do you think is the need of the hour for EV penetration to increase in India? See, uh, this this year, you know, uh, in 24-25, I feel, you know, there will be more than 15 new product launches by the different OEMs. All mass market players, top five players will launch their new models. Uh, everybody will have an EV portfolio in their, you know, uh, in their hand. So we see that this year, the EV growth will be much higher compared to previous years. Uh, yes, I do agree there are challenges in terms of, uh, con when, it, when it comes to a consumer in terms of EV adoption. Still, there's a lot of challenges in terms of charging infra. Uh, there is a uh, problem in terms of setting up the home charging. The public infra is not so good. The power availability is not so good. Secondly, the product choices are limited. Uh, customer has a range, range anxiety issue. The cost of ownership is a problem. So, I think once these problems are addressed, the market will grow much faster and much stronger. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vinkesh, come in on this, you know, Ajay was pointing out the number of problems that have been uh, a hindrance to EV penetration. But these are problems that have existed for the last many years. Why do you think, uh, you know, solutions have not been found whereby there's more penetration? I mean, we're talking about what uh, PV penetration is sub 2%. Even two-wheelers, which is picking up, you know, quite a bit, the penetration is just about 5-6%. So what is lacking, you think? See, uh, as of the... Sorry. Sorry. Case, of, go ahead. Okay, so as I, I feel the options level in the market is majorly skewed towards non-EV. So if you see on the car fronts also, uh, there's one only OEM, Tata, who has some products where they can say there are three or four products. If you leave apart Tata, all the other OEMs presence in EV is just a, a showcase. One product and that too not doing great some hundred numbers and if you see and in here it's some thousand not even big similar happening in two-wheeler so you have some 30 40 odd models of two-wheelers available where the fuel engines are but when you start counting on ev there are what 10 or 15 good models which are available and obviously these availability across the districts in india is also limited and restricted so 
uh, the customers don't have choice and uh, uh, reach also on the dealer's front where they can get such vehicle. Where, what I think the OEMs are still not very focused on the electric vehicle front. There are some o OEMs who are actually anti-EVs. There are some who are working towards that. But like Ajay said, we'll have to watch another year. I feel 2025 would be the year of big bang EV launches from all the OEMs. And when we have EV options available with all the OEMs in India, uh, surely the ratio will go up, but not as high as what the government is expecting. So like latest I heard 2030, they expect 30% of passenger vehicle, some 50 or 80% are from two wheelers and three wheelers. This is kind, some kind of numbers where unless and until government get, goes out of the uh, box and supports in subsidies, which is, as of now, you see FAM3 has gone down, I don't think those percentage happening. But yes, EV ratio will go ahead uh, year on year or month on month also. Okay. Ajay, jump in on that. I mean, you know, Vinkesh made a very good point. Options are very limited and the OEMs are not very serious apart from the Tata Group. There's no other OEM that has a comprehensive EV model, but it could also be a chicken and egg situation because, you know, there is still charging infrastructure issues, there is range anxiety. So maybe OEMs prefer to go slow. Your thoughts here? See, uh, if you see uh, off late, last three, four months after the price revision by Tata and MG, the mass market models like uh, Tiago EV and Comet have started growing. So it's, it's not fair to say that, you know, consumers are not accepting the products if it makes sense in terms of cost of ownership, entry cost, you know, so the acceptance is there. The challenges are there definitely in terms of, you know, uh, the as of now, the other, all OEMs are not so aggressive in terms of pushing the EV products. Once every OEM has a decent EV portfolio, I think market should naturally grow. I don't see a challenge there. Hmm. Uh, you want to comment specifically, Ajay, on the two-wheeler market because, you know, it's been consolidating for a while with six to seven large players out of which four players enjoy 80% of the market share. Do you think that could be the dynamics even over the next couple of years? And now you have the PLI also that has been approved. So how do you see the market dynamics change in the two-wheeler EV space? See, again, in two-wheeler, the same problem. The OEMs who are already the leaders are not very serious. If you see the top players... Uh, Hero, Bajaj, uh, Honda, they're not very seriously, uh, you know, having a EV portfolio. The EV is, as of now, being, you know, they, the, the startups are leading the EV ecosystem. Mm -hmm. the, automobile is not a business wherein, you know, you can build the channel, you can build the infrastructure overnight. It takes time to build that. Until unless the existing OEMs try and build that, in, use the existing infra infrastructure to push the EV, uh, it will take time. Mm -hmm. But can it also be the case that, I mean, as you mentioned, right, startups are leading the EV ecosystem. Vinkesh, I want you to come in on that. Will it be very tough for the startups to sort of scale up this business in a big way? And uh, is, it a, uh, is it mandatory for the incumbent players, the legacy players to sort of scale up their business for the penetration to take off in a big way in uh, two-wheelers? You're right on your point. See, uh, companies like TVS who have really gone out of... Uh, the way to launch EVs through their regular uh, uh, co-dealer, regular dealers, have really seen some tandem going on. They are doing now 12,000 plus or 15,000 every month, uh, which is the only company, legacy player, who is doing something in EV. Like you talk of Bajaj, they have only one product, which is Chetak, and also their presence is not there all over India. Talk of Hero. Uh, they, are, they have come through one product and still their presence is less. Honda motorcycle has yet not launched an electric vehicle in India. So if you see the legacy players, I feel they are uh, they are still waiting for I don't know what. But unless and until these four legacy players go out of the way, uh, have an EV portfolio through their regular dealers and don't think of having an, a, a special EV dealer separate, then the reach becomes a problem. So until and unless that happens, I don't see EV market going big in two-wheeler. No doubt it's one of the best if you talk of uh, compared to cars or CVs. But still, the melting point or the top point is still there. Uh, I'll give you a small example. I'm talking of one small district where uh, one OEM sells a 1,000 products per month, whereas its EV portfolio is selling 30 vehicles per month. And mm -hmm. that's how where major districts of India is going through if you talk of the leave apart the TVS uh, for Hero or Bajaj. And that is where the major problem is. The similar what has happening in passenger vehicle, 
is happening in two wheelers also. The OEMs are not focused towards EV and they're not com coming got up it, with got it. options. Okay, uh, Ajay, one final word from your end. Is Chinese competition a big threat in India? Because globally, Chinese competition has sort of, you know, uh, become a big threat. But what about the Indian markets? I don't see that. Yeah. See, last few years, you, we, we have been hearing a lot of stories of Chinese PV makers coming in, Great Wall Motors and other players. Mm. But it's very difficult. It, automobile is not a, you know, fly-by-night operation. So you build up quickly and then uh, establish. So I don't see much challenge there. And definitely the rules and regulations and the laws doesn't give them a free way to run the business in India. Got it. All right, gentlemen, we've run out of time, but not out of questions. Thank you so much for explaining, uh, you know, the entire EV ecosystem to us and the slowdown that we've seen globally after Tesla announcing that they've seen a drop in sales. With that, it's curtains down on Bazaar. Thanks a lot for watching.